today as World Fish Migration Day, a day intended to recognise the importance of open rivers and migratory fish. Um, as we all know, fish are crucial to healthy and productive river systems, um, but many of the migratory fish species are threatened by the sorts of things that uh, man does to rivers in order to exploit them, like dams and weirs and the like, and interfere with uh, natural fish migration. Um, so today we've got some special guests with us. We've got some experience uh, firsthand with uh, efforts to help native fish uh, migrate in these systems, even um, though we've interfered with them. And so I'll start off by introducing our guests before they start off. Firstly, we've got Greg Ringwood. Greg's a fisheries scientist at River Health and Habitat Restoration. He's experienced in soil, water, and environmental science, and particularly relevant to this today, he was part of the River Prize winning team in 2012 that restored fish populations in the Condamine River in southeast Queensland. We also, from uh, quite a bit further down south, we have uh, Tom Scarborough. Um, Tom uh, won the um, Emerging Water Professionals Award run by IRF um, last year. Tom's estuary manager at Karangamite Catchment Management Authority, which is right down on the Victorian coast. Many people will know um, it's a part way down that, I think. Um, and Tom will be talking about a case study of fish migration practices and how they manage on a daily basis and in particular engaging the community in this. Um, now one of the things we're trying to do, as you can imagine, if you're trying to run a teleconference, two industries said there were going to be something like 30 people potentially involved today, so if we try and run it as a uh, teleconference, uh, it'll get very messy. Um, what we'd like to do is encourage you to send us any questions you've got um, through or for the presenters in one of two ways. You can use the GoToMeeting chat function and send a message to International River Foundation. Or if you're on Twitter, you can send um, your questions to the hashtag. All right. So what I'll do now is um, enough from me. I'll hand over to Greg. And Greg, you can uh, run us through a bit of an overview, please. All right. Morning, everyone. Um, my background in fish passage started off with um, working in policy in Australia, mainly um, in the Queensland. So the picture down the bottom of the slide here is a good reason why we need fish passage. That was two species of fish that were trying to migrate upstream to breed. And that is a photo. They were about 20 kilometres long in the river. Um, fish move for a variety of reasons. The key message I want to get across here is they move locally. Um, you know, find things like food, shelter. They move daily, so particularly big predatory fish like Murray Cod, Jewfish and Barramundi, they hang out in the deep holes during the day, but they move into the shallows at night to feed. It's also seasonal movements. They move between warmer and cooler water. They look for the cooler water in some of the warmer water in winter. They look for the food when it's available. And then the migratory species mainly move to breed. Um, yeah, the fish movement to access food, shelter, habitat, avoid predation, breed. And in the outback river systems in Australia, finding drought refuge water holes is a very important reason to have fish movement. Fish not only move up and down the river systems, they also move out onto the floodplain. That can be important for breeding and for shelter, particularly in the early life stages. They also move between river systems that way. And fish move generally in Australia on flows in the freshwater system, and they move across the whole flow curve. So often when people are building barriers, they say, well, it's important, but we can only provide 
fish passage on a certain part of the flow curve, but it doesn't really work like that for the fish. The photo down the bottom is on the Murray, and obviously all those pelicans are having a really good feed because the fish are at a barrier there and they can't move past it. And one of the key messages with fish passage is nearly all commercial, recreational and cultural fish species in freshwater and estuarine and inland waters need fish passage either for themselves or their food sources. All right, um, fish reason barriers can exist as fish swim at burst speed, so that's a bit like sprinting. They can do it for a very short length of time. A lot of the Australian fish are very poor swimmers, and we're talking about they're swimming at burst speed for seconds. It's the same speed's a bit like jogging. You can do that for a bit longer. You can't cope with as high water velocities. And then cruising speeds like walking, you can do that all day, but you basically can't cope with any increase in water velocities. Barriers to fish passage are commonly caused by, so water drop. In Australia, anything above about 10 centimetres is more or less a barrier to most fish. Um, high water velocities and turbulence can be barriers, shallow flows, barriers, lack of rest areas, so if they've got to swim at burst speed for too long, that'll be a barrier, and also dark areas, so if you see on the, on the photos to the side, like that arch culvert on the bottom, it basically is a barrier to nearly all of those things. Other things that can be barriers is if there's a debris blockage, so things like trash racks and that get blocked up with debris, fish can't get past, and poor water quality, things like cold water pollution can be a barrier to fish passage as well. All right, um, in Australia there's a real lack of understanding of the importance in fish passage. If you look at somewhere like in Europe, say Germany, they shut down their hydro power stations while the fish are migrating. It's seen as that important. In America, they spend billions on um, fish passage and fish offtakes and screening. So in Australia, it's very early on and there's not a lot of importance placed on it. It's really hard to see fish passage without monitoring and evaluation. Um, most barriers are partial barriers other than big dams, things like culverts and causeways. They exclude fish at certain parts of the flow or in certain size classes, so maybe the smaller fish and the juvenile fish. Um, when we talk about fishways and fish passage solutions, they're usually increasing the fish passage across a certain part of the hydrograph so fish can pass for more of the flows. And fish passage is usually designed to target a certain size class of fish. If you look at the big fish lift on the right there, that's targeting large fish. But the, the little cone structure on the left, that's targeting smaller fish. Often, depending on the size of the barrier you're going up, the more simple you can build your fish passage solution, the better. The more complex it is, often the more maintenance that's required. So up the top left picture, you know, that's pretty simple. That's more or less reconstructing a stream bed through a culvert. Then you move on to the next photo. That's baffles inside a culvert and then cane or rock ramp sort of fishways. You know, they've all got their place. Um, look down the bottom left photo. Often we're talking about a lot of fish moving. That was some monitoring on a cane fish way up in the Gulf and we're getting up to 2,000 fish per hour shot moving through that fish way. Throw in threatened species, that's a Queensland lungfish, you've got to spe specifically cater for them. And the other important point is most aquatic species migrate, that's just a picture of some shrimps or macabracian, but turtles, a whole host of things migrate, so you need to consider them as well. So I'll do a bit of a case study. So this is Loudon Weir Fishway. It 
operates reasonably successfully, but it's required a lot of TLC over the years. Um, it's just southwest of Dalby, which is about three hours west of Brisbane and southern Queensland for people to know. It's in the northern part of the Murray-Darling Basin. So it was the first, it's a vertical slot fishway and it was the first fishway that was required under legislation in Queensland. The people that were upgrading the weir there were really unhappy about having to build a fishway on that extra cost. Um, it was an early design. There wasn't a lot of experience and there wasn't a lot of understanding of what was actually required and the details at the site were a bit sketchy. So the end result was a fishway that rarely worked properly. Add to this, it was operated by the local government staff and the community had a lack of understanding about how the fishway operated and they thought it was costing them water. So the water behind the weir was used for irrigation and drinking water and the community was really putting a lot of pressure on the local council elected officials that this fishway was costing them their water. So major improvements were required to get the fishway to work. Basically the, the tailwater level didn't meet the exit of the fishway on the downstream side. So needed to add extra cells to drop the bottom of the fishway nearly a metre. It was designed so that the fishway would operate for about 14 weeks a year. There was also a low flow channel added to allow that to happen. Um, the these improvements were about three quarters of the way through being completed and the floods hit in 2008 9 That picture on the right you can see that's part of the fishway sitting on the opposite side of the river. So that had to be gone in and repaired again. So the fishway was finished. And then the council didn't know how to operate the fishway. It was manually open and closed, so we needed an operational plan. Got a consultant to do it. It was a fairly complex plan. It would have worked really well if a big water provider was operating it, but the council didn't understand the plan and they thought it was costing them water. Back to the old problem. So in the end, the solution was just to say, if water's flying over the weir, turn the fishway on, and if it stops, turn it off. And they could accept that, and they took ownership of operating it then. Um, the fishway was operating well, and then we got hit by the 10-11 floods, are the worst floods in memory. The picture there on the left is in Toowoomba City, and the picture on the right is Warrego Highway between Toowoomba and Dalby. You can see how much water is flowing through and the velocity of the water. So the fishway had several metres of water over it. We really expected that when the water went down, we'd see what happened in 2008-9 happened again, but there was no structural damage to the fishway, but there was debris all over it, through it, above it, below it. You can see pictures of all the trees on top of it. Um, the uncovered cells that were added in the upgrade, they had that sort of debris inside it. You can see the picture on the bottom left, a lot of silt and a lot of logs and that inside the cell. The picture on the right, it's probably about 12 to 15 cubic metres of sediment in that cell. So it required a lot of effort to clean it. So add to the fact that fishways are confined spaces had to get in vacuum trucks, cost tens of thousands, got it clean, got hit by another flood almost straight away, had to do it all again. So the solution was to cover the rest of the fishway with the grate. That was done. 
the fishway was turned on and basically had about 15 months of continuous flow. So it was really good for fish passage. Um, at the end of that flow, when the water level went down, the grates worked really well. There was only minor debris blockages, a little bit of sediment, mainly caused by little sticks, only about a centimetre in diameter, sometimes a little bit bigger and about 200 to 300 mil long. And it was just a matter of making up a custom tool so that we could clean the fishway. It was really a lot easier than it had been in the past. So the entrances of the fishway, so you can see on the picture on the left, that's a downstream entrance for the low flow channel. And on the right, that's a downstream entrance for the high flow. So there's two different entrances depending on the tail water level. So they were modified to allow more fish to get into the fishway. That was done successfully. And then between the different cells, there was, it was designed to have 160 mil head loss. And that was very variable. You can see by the graph there on the right, it was all over the place. And basically, some were more, some were less. There was a lot of velocity and turbulence issues between the cells. So we got in and cleaned that up, adjusted the slot widths. You're talking very fine margins there, so within 5%. And then monitored the fishway. The fish didn't seem to mind it. The turbulence issues had been solved, but there was still a fair amount of um, variation between the head loss between cells, but it didn't really seem to be an issue. Um, monitoring and evaluation showed improvements of fish. Things like golden perch, there was 10 times as many upstream of the fishway. Gudgeon increased six times. Tandana's catfish, three times. Herring, which was a really important food source for most native fish, doubled in numbers. Um, things like Murray cod came back. They were, went from virtually zero to a regular catch. And then dwarf flathead gudgeon and hurdles tandan, which hadn't been seen above that barrier for over 20 years, returned. So that was really um, important. The other thing was because we had confidence that fish passage was working, we could then look at other things if the fish weren't returning into certain areas. We knew it had to be something else. Maybe it was something to do with habitat and it wasn't fish passage. So that was important that we had confidence in the fish passage for our adaptive management. And that led to um, the winning of the River Prize in 2012 and two other awards. Thank you. Excellent, thanks for that. I just got a couple of quick questions. Most percentage changes in the fish populations, over what time frame did that happen? Um, that was over four years and they've continued to improve since then. So there are a lot. So those figures that I gave there were the 2012 ones for the um, when the River Prize was won and the um, the background monitoring in 2008. Okay, great. And we've also just got a question on what the um, what SMEC stands for. Oh, that's the consultancy that did the operational plan that was so it was a good operational plan it was basically the um, the council couldn't accept the science that was in it and the operators that were operating the weir couldn't operate the weir it was too complex for them to operate it so all right it's back well, Simple solution is the best, often. 
All right, well, thanks for that, Greg. Um, and now, um, uh, Tom, we'll pass over to you the, the challenges of uh, running the technology and doing your session. Cool, thanks for that, Ian. Just see if I can change slides. Okay, so yeah, thanks Ian. My name's Tom Scarborough. Um, I work for the Kerangamite Catchment Management Authority and um, I've been asked today to come and talk around estuary management within the Kerangamite region and um, what its relationship with native fish migration is. So just to give you a very quick overview of um, essentially what an estuary is, I suppose. Um, estuaries are semi-enclosed bodies of water where water from the sea mixes with fresh water flowing from the land and they're important and productive parts um, of the coastal region. In that photo there's an aerial shot of the Jelly Brand estuary. So just to give you a bit of an idea of where we are, so the Krangamite region's down in um, southwest Victoria. Um, it essentially goes from um, about where Geelong is through to Peterborough. So um, if anyone knows where the Great Ocean Road is, it's a, a large sort of um, area through there. We have about 40 estuaries within our region um, and a majority of the estuaries within our part of the world are intermittent estuaries apart from the Barwon. Um, and in intermittent estuaries, they're estuaries that have sandbars that periodically close um, their connection to the ocean. So a lot of estuaries um, like this in, uh, similar to this in Victoria, I suppose. So to give a bit of context, I suppose, to make it a little bit easier to understand when we talk about the fish migration, when we're looking at estuary management, um, there's a number of different things that are at play. So essentially there's a, a permit that's put in place by um, by the catchment management authorities. So that generally goes to a land manager, somebody such as Parks Victoria, to conduct the works of actually artificially opening these intermittent estuaries if there's any flooding that takes place. Um, we like to have a memorandum of understanding with the direct stakeholders and people that are involved around those artificial openings. And then we have estuary management plans that are more of a, um, more of a community um, communication tool and a management action plan that um, brings in the broader sort of estuary management that's a little bit wider than um, just artificial openings. And then overlaying all of that, we've got um, a tool called the Estuary Management Support System, or EAMS, that helps us um, work through a lot of the, um, the complexities around estuary management. So this is just a photo to give you an example of um, an estuary. This is Anglesey River Estuary, um, and you can see the channel there at the mouth where um, where it's been artificially opened to connect the estuary to the ocean. So essentially this happens when um, we have modified systems or periods of low flow where a berm forms at the mouth, the estuary water level comes up in the estuary behind and it's only when it starts to create um, flooding over uh, built infrastructure or roads or things like that that force the hand as to whether or not um, the estuary will get artificially opened instead of allowing the natural hydrological cycle to, to take place. So in making these decisions as to whether or not the, um, the estuary is going to get opened or it's safe for it to be opened, um, we've got EAMS which is a decision support tool that guides the estuary managers when making the decision whether or not to artificially open the estuary. And I guess it's an example of a process of agency and stakeholder interaction that is combined to produce a decision support tool which takes into account three main factors, being science, regulatory provisions and public values. Um, the EAMS database was developed in, um, by Deakin University with input from a steering group and a technical advisory group um, in 2006. So it has been in place um, for, for a little while now. The EAMS support tool has been recently moved into a, um, into a web-based um, platform. Um, so we do have EAMS in place across the state and most of the catchment management authorities are using it. 
So to give you an idea of some of the things that um, that the EAMS database takes into account, I've um, just taken a screen snapshot here that shows um, the drop down of um, different assets that are considered when deciding whether or not to open it. So you've got everything from like your EVCs to flora and birds and fish, fishing, um, roads, jetties. So essentially it's trying to capture all of those environmental, social and economic values that are affected by whether um, the decision is made to artificially open or not open the estuary. So that becomes important for a daylight state when we're talking about fish migration in terms of understanding what the implications are of opening, artificially opening an estuary, changing the natural flow regime and how that impacts on different fish within the system. So you can see there um, we're on the score of the fish section, but it's, um, it's also grouped the different um, fish species into different um, classifications to help um, when informing those decisions around whether to open it or not. So um, there's a complete list of fish species was previously recorded from Victorian estuaries and was reviewed by the technical advisory group in the development of EAMS. So there were 49 species that were considered to be potentially impacted by estuary entrance decisions and they were included within EAMS. Species that are infrequent visitors from marine and freshwater habitats and introduced species were not included. Um, the species that were likely to be similarly impacted by estuary entrance management decisions were grouped using characteristics of life history. So um, essentially, I guess the easiest way to think about it is um, there's the species that are sort of non-estuary independent which is your marine and freshwater, so they're species that can just survive um, out to sea in the salt water or up in the fresh, but they may choose to use the estuary at different, um, different times. But then you've also got your estuary dependent, so that's your, um, your seasonal soil of your obligate and your fluctuative, so that's your, your species that either need it or they are optional as to whether they use it or not. And then you've got your estuarine species that are permanently within the estuary. So there's a bit of a conceptual diagram here that was developed as part of um, putting this together by um, Deakin University. And it sort of just gives that conceptual um, idea. You can see the estuary flowing from the top right corner down to the left. So in the bottom left, you've got your marine species that may come in and out. In your top right corner, you've got your freshwater species that may come into the top half of the estuary depending on conditions. Um, you've then got estuarine permanent um, species like your black brim that might just stay within the estuary. And then you've got um, your seasonal um, species, so like your flocculative, like your yellow eye mullet that might come in and out, and your obligate, so your, your common galaxidin species that, um, yeah, that need that um, that estuary to be able to be open and closed at different times for completing their life cycle. So the sort of things that are then overlaid with this in making the decision whether to open an estuary or not might be like spawning periods for black brim and estuary perch and whether there's a chance of higher than normal flows and egg loss or um, things like that. So I guess in concluding, um, Essentially, um, estuaries are complex and dynamic systems that co require collaboration from agencies in the broader community to effectively manage. And native fish, uh, one yeah, really important aspect that estuary managers need to consider when deciding whether to open or not open an estuary mouth. So that's that all from me. Thanks. Um. All right, well, thanks for those uh, two brief talks, um, uh, people. So I think what we might do is uh, now have a look to uh, what questions have been uh, submitted. Maybe we start with how can we balance our need for infrastructure around rivers with the protection of migratory fish? Yeah, I suppose, um, well, it's important and you need to do a bit of a cost-benefit analysis, as I said in Queensland, there's a requirement under legislation. So if you build a barrier, you have to 
provide adequate fish passage, which is a um, bit of a um, interesting solution because different people have different ideas of what's adequate. Um, you tend to get basically the bigger the river system is, the more important it is. So the more important the fish passage is, and the closer to the coast, usually the more important it is. And then you've got to look at if there's threatened species in there as well, and if they've got special requirements. So you know things like the um, one fish in the burnet. The burnet's got a lot of a lot of fish passage solutions on it because of the lung fish. But um, yeah, it's always a compromise in Australia. If you look at road crossings that are barriers, there's literally tens of thousands of road crossings in Queensland, and even to this day, a lot of them are getting built without providing fish passage, surely because the um, importance of it isn't recognised by a lot of the community and the people that build these structures. Uh, just on that, Greg, um, you say there's a legislative requirement to do something about new structures. Is there anything yeah. in the legislation about um, improving old structures? Um, no, there's not, but in saying that, often if a new structure is getting built with the offset legislation, you can require um, or you can achieve an upgrade of an existing structure with retrofitting. So there is some, like the legislation is triggered if, if a barrier is built, replaced or increased in height. So quite often you'll get an upgrading of a structure or trigger it. But in saying that, it's no use building a, a you know, gold-plated fishway on a barrier if there's another barrier immediately above or below it. You're better off, you know, trying to get fish passage across both of them. Yeah. Um, also, there's another question uh, from the group. You talked about a lack of understanding of the importance of fish passage in Australia. Have you have you seen that change in, in over the time of your career? Oh no, not really. Um, so even like people, the wreck fishing community, you'd think they have a good understanding, but a very small percentage of wreck fishers actually have an understanding of how important it is. And even um, even people that do restoration works on creeks, you often get questions like, "Is this fish passage really important?" So it's it's an ongoing issue, and because the density of people in Australia aren't really high, it is a cost benefit and people that build lots of structures like main roads up here like to keep it as quiet as possible because it's an additional cost to them. So, yeah. um, just to like clarify, when, when Greg's talking about legislation, he's talking specifically about the Queensland legislation. Yes. Yep. Um, <clears throat> just on that point about the um, whether fish passage is being better understood, um, Tom, did you have a viewpoint on that? Um, yeah, uh, I think in the wider community it's probably not highly publicised, but I think that in with the environmental sector it is it has come a long way in terms of. Um, there's a lot of policy and actions sort of derived around that, whether it's in, like in Victoria, it's outlined in the Victorian Waterway Management Strategy, but then also picked up and carried through um, each of the different um, catchment management authorities. So I think there's more work being done in that space. So it is getting a little bit of traction, but I'd agree that the wider community, it's probably not a huge topic. Um, another question for you, Tom, was, um, uh, where the where you have artificially opened up estuary channels has that had 
um, uh, significant impacts such as increasing salinity levels in the in the lower reaches of the river. Uh, yes, so yeah, whenever the uh, an estuary is artificially opened, you're reconnecting um, the marine environment with the estuary. So as you get your tidal exchange, you will get that that movement of the salt wedge through the estuary. So when the estuary is closed, it will generally stratify. So the denser, saltier water will go and sit on the bottom, and the fresher water will sit on the top. When the artificial opening happens, the fresh water from the surface tends to go out with the outgoing tide and the initial rush of the water going out, and then with the turn of the tide you'll see more um, saline water coming and pushing back up into the estuary. So just on that, so is that something you consciously try and manage sometimes in terms of, because um, I would presume that uh, for any of the species that are going to be worried by changes in salinity levels, particularly rapid changes, in salinity level. So do you sometimes deliberately, for instance, cut a shallower channel to slow that process down or similar? Yeah, yeah, we do try and always replicate what we'd expect the natural opening to look like. So we, um, in nearly all of the artificial openings, we'll try and do quite a shallow opening. So that way, as the, the water starts to go, it'll gather its own momentum and, um, and start to cut out a channel and um, yeah, get that estuary opening taking place. The the risk with doing a deeper opening and allowing that initial rush to be too great is there's less of an opportunity for fish that might be looking for triggers or opportunities to move out to, to spawn or um, migrate. They, um, they might have less time to be able to see those. They may also have too much velocity in the water moving out, especially for juvenile fish. So, yeah, so where possible we do try and um, slow that opening down as much as possible, I suppose. Uh, um, uh, back up to you, Greg, a question is um, uh, an inquiry about what might be available in terms of uh, fishway design criteria or guides. Oh, well, there is, um, there is stuff available. I suppose in Queensland, for people that don't know, there was a major cull of staff in those sorts of areas with the last government. So those um, the fishway teams got disbanded. So they're working as consultants now, and um, you know most of those guidelines and that we had on fish passage are being taken down off the web. I suppose. But um, there's a number of people across Australia that do work on fish passage. So, yeah, if you search the net, you'll come across them or guidelines and that. But you look at websites, most of the fisheries agencies have got some guidelines and places like the MDBA have got some stuff as good starting points. Right, thanks. So if you want to get into technical stuff, you really need to speak to a specific fishway biologist for site-specific design requirements and species-specific, presumably. There are some, you know, off-the-shelf sort of baffles and canes and those sorts of um, solutions for in culverts and those things available as well. Um, one for both Greg and Tom, um, drawing on your experience, um, you've both talked about who you, who you work with in terms of um, uh, to improve fish passage and, and to then maintain it, but can you just sort of talk about the, the breadth of sectors and businesses and so on that, that have been involved in some of these projects in the past? Is it, is it just for instance, um, Greg, has it just been um, local government that was involved in the um, uh, condo mine example, or, or were there a wider community groups involved? In that particular example, there was three levels of government. So there was funding from the Australian government, the state government, 
and then the local council. There was local businesses involved, local landholders, so a local engineering firm did the upgrades of the fishway to make it work properly. Um, a lot of education with local community to get them to understand that it was important and that the fishway wasn't costing them water. So if you looked at it as a whole, there was probably 70 partners involved in that fishway. Um, education's a time-consuming component, but it's extremely important. You know, it took us a long time where now the community and the council are fully behind operating the fishway, which back when they were required to put it on, you know, they were really resentful of having a fishway, whereas now it's seen as an asset. So it was a, um, a pretty big turnaround. And Tom, in, in your part of the world? Uh, sorry, my internet dropped out for a bit, so I missed the question. Oh, um, uh, we're just, the question's about, uh, aside from the people directly involved in, in doing some of what you're talking about, what, what, what uh, sectors, businesses and professions and other people from the community are involved in, in some of the work in regards to managing fish passage? Yeah, so um, I guess it's the, for, for the scenario that I'm working in, I suppose fish passage is a key component, but it's probably not one of the, um, the main drivers around the estuary management. So there's a lot of people that are involved, whether it's landowners um, from an agricultural perspective to the Great Ocean Road being inundated or all of these other um, things that are related to whether the estuary gets opened and allows that fish migration and um, allows time of it being closed as well. So it's educating and working with those other groups that aren't necessarily from an environmental background or have a lot of knowledge in that space around why it is important to have these different cycles in different times. So yeah, there's a huge, huge range of stakeholders that are involved in the process. I, um Another question I think perhaps we'll get both of you to answer it because you're giving different perspectives we can look at is, um, uh, Greg, you talked about uh, the previous state government had cut back staff in this area and you also mentioned that um, the work that was done at Condamine was the, the core funding was uh, federal government uh, funding. Um, it's a question to both of you but I'll start off with, uh, with Greg. Is, is, um, uh, do you see much on the horizon in terms of plans for um, improving the, um, or putting in new fishways or improving fishways and, and how they might be funded? The short answer is probably no. Um, even like Loudon's probably at risk of, um, you know, if it had major damage and required major um, repairs like have happened in the past, you know, it'd, it'd be hard to um, get that money. The, while the council's really supportive of operating it, they don't have a requirement to um, maintain it. So, you know, it's unlikely if it required tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix that they'd cough that dollars up and there's not really anyone driving that specifically anymore. So, you know, while it's important, it's, um, it's something that there's not a lot of focus on at the moment, I suppose. There's still focus on for new stuff, but maintaining or retrofitting fish passage isn't a high priority under the current economic situation. Hmm. And Tom, what are you seeing in Victoria? Um, from my sp perspective, I suppose, around estuary management, it's been reasonably positive, I suppose, in terms of um, like the more recent Victorian waterway management strategy had its own chapter for estuaries, which was a big move forward. And I think that estuary management's 
um, being recognised for some of the um, challenges and the number of different people that it impacts. So, um, so yeah, funding wise, it hasn't been too bad. Mm. Um, I might just give a briefly a, a South Australian perspective, having spent the last three years working um, in the Murray down there, and um, it's really interesting, particularly in regards to uh, infrastructure. What's happening there is this um, something in the order of three hundred million dollars being spent, um, Commonwealth money, but through the state government agencies on improving um, flow paths uh, and so on, partly for, at least in part, for fish passage, but across the floodplains in the lower part of the Murray. So it's a, it's a, a lot of money is being spent. Um, uh, quite a bit of that's about is in evaluation and and rejigging what's there because the the and I suspect this is the case in the floodplain and other parts of the Murray too is that the floodplain's covered in um, structures that have been put in for all sorts of reasons, including for environmental uh, watering purposes, that aren't necessarily the right structure in the right place. And it's been interesting that one of the things that's emerged out of that and one of the real uh, worry areas for the Commonwealth in terms of its investment down there is who owns the structure after it's built and who has responsibility for that ongoing management. Because uh, you know, I don't have the numbers, but of the hundreds if not thousands of, of structures, and when I say structures are anything from a, you know, a two foot culvert through to something that's designed to put you know, a gig a gig a litre of water a day through it. Um, it's not clear um, on these structures that are often built on state government land. But it's not clear who actually owns them in a management sense, which has all sorts of flow ones. One of them being under the change workplace and health and safety regulations in this country. Uh, I know, Greg, you mentioned about the uh, enclosed space at the uh, Loudoun Weir, I mean that's that's having a major impact on the cost of, not just the cost of retrofitting and maintaining these things, but who is responsible for them. It's actually, it's got all sorts of other flow on and knock on effects. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, Tom, uh, another question in regards to uh, Salinity. Um, have you the so we've already identified that when you're up in those up, and you've said before that that's only under specific circumstances. Um, have you had issues in regards to um, water quality in terms of people pulling water out of those uh, estuaries for for human purposes in in, some, in one form or another? Um, yeah, we have, we do have issues with water quality. Um, each of our different estuaries are quite unique and specific in terms of the different problems that we have. So, um, like in Anglesey, we have issues with water quality around um, coastal acid sulphate soils. So, um, that's sort of overlaid with the management of the estuary there. We have other larger systems where there's offtakes for water supply for nearby towns. Um, so having water extractions changes the amount of inflow and flow that you get coming down um, into an estuary. So as the estu so if the intermittent estuary is closed and the water is sitting back over the floodplain, and especially over your summer months, um, as it starts to um, yeah break down and um, become um, sort of have your dissolved oxygen levels drop out then the amount of inflow that you get coming from upstream um, greatly changes the amount of oxygen that you're getting within the system. So then if you are uh, artificially opening the estuary, you risk losing whatever oxygenated water you've got on the surface layer out to sea, which could result in um, a fish death event. So, so in terms of issues with water quality and water extraction, it is quite a, um, yeah, quite a big issue that we, we do try to um, to factor in in any of our decisions as to whether we 
kind of officially open or don't open an estuary. Excellent. All right. Well, look, everybody, we're getting towards the end of the hour that we um, uh, allocated for this session. Um, just want to, uh, uh, we, we, we have to do a um, promotion of uh, the things that we're involved in at the moment and the big, big uh, occupier of time for International River Foundation at the moment is the next River Symposium, uh, which if you're not aware yet is going to be held in New Delhi in India in September, the first time the River Symposium's ever been held outside uh, Australia. Uh, and we're particularly keen to um, encourage anybody that's involved in this this morning to have a think about uh, abstracts and the possibility of attending the symposium. Um, just a note, it was interesting, I, I, when I first came in this job I was a bit concerned about the cost of getting to New Delhi for delegates. Um, at the moment you can book an airfare there and back with a uh, a fairly good quality airline for about a thousand dollars Australian, so it's not uh, it's not actually as expensive as a, um, perhaps I thought it was going to be. Um, we've also opened up the Emerging River Professionals Award, which, uh, uh, as we mentioned in the introductions, um, Tom, you were the winner of that last year. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yep, um, and if you go to our Websites, you'll find out some information on both those things. Um, and of course, we're using Facebook and Twitter to keep people informed. So if you're not, if you're interested in, in following stuff as it happens, then uh, uh, by all means um, register your interest via those platforms. Um, so, um, Tom. Um, Greg, thank you for your presentations and your insight in the panels. Did you have any, any closing comments you particularly wanted to make? Oh, not really. Um, you know, fish passage is important. It's in, as important as you know, river restoration, water quality, habitat, all the rest of it. They all go hand in hand. Without one, you can't really do the, the rest properly. You just got to Tom? look at Sorry. Yeah, I'd just like to thank the International River Foundation. I think it's a, a great initiative and a good way to just hold a short one-hour webinar where it can have people from all over the place involved and build knowledge on it. So uh, I think it's a good initiative. Thanks. All right. Um, and just um, to let you know that other sectors are interested in this as well, the Irrigation Australia Limited's got its annual conference in Melbourne next week uh, and there's a session there in regards to building and maintaining fishways because of course uh, fishways are a significant issue particularly for the big uh, water supply organisations like Golden Murray Water and the like uh, and so there was a sufficient interest to run a session um, at the conference next week. Uh, Tanushree, did you have any closing comments to make? Uh, no, just thanks very much everyone for coming. Hope you got something out of it today. If anybody had any uh, comments or concerns or anything to raise after we've finished, by all means uh, um, flick us an email in terms of if you had any issues with it dropping in and dropping out or um, the like, uh, let us know. Uh, and we'll try and improve for next time. But uh, thanks very much to everybody and um, spot on time closing up. Thank you.